Today we're going to be looking at the classical era of music, but before we do, I want to take a look backwards at the Baroque era, and I want, would like you to just answer these questions in review. So first of all, list two composers from the Baroque era. Think about it, think of the, what we just studied, and list two composers from the Baroque era. Secondly, when was the Baroque era? Hmm, that's a, tr that's a tricky one, but actually not so tricky. So, and then finally, list two characteristics of music from the Baroque era. Two characteristics of music that we have studied just recently. It was the last chapter. All right, once you've done this, go ahead and move forward. When we talk about classical music, we have a tendency to include everything that is orchestral, or big choral numbers that, that sound classical to us is, is it's considered classical music. Anything that's on KUSC um, or those classical radio stations is considered classical music. But in truth, the classical era was only a very short amount of time. It was approximately from 1750 to 1800. It actually, uh, or it can be considered that it, it may have started a little bit earlier, like around 1720, but it's a, very, a relatively short amount of time. But a classic is something that endures. The music that we call cl um, classical music that was from strictly the classical era was the first music to thrive without interruption for a long, long time. So Joseph Haydn, he lived from 1732 to 1809. He was a classical composer. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, who lived from 1756 to 1791, he was another classical composer. These were the two leading composers of this era, and they wrote music that has never truly gone out of fashion. The term classical also refers to Greek and Roman antiquity. And this, this the ideals of the Greeks and the Romans very strongly influenced the arts and the and the architecture of this period, as uh, uh, this new kind of thinking took hold. So Baroque ornamentation and the love of virtuosity and these expressive extremes are going to give way to more classical ideals of balance and clarity and naturalness. The 18th century as a whole, but in particularly the, the period between 1720 to 1790, is known as the Age of Enlightenment. Enlightenment thought that uh, reason could bring humankind into a new age of splendor. It's, it's an idea where um, the people were freed from their, their dark su superstitions of the past and they, they, they were enlightened. Um, so science becomes much, much more important during the Enlightenment and for Enlightenment artists and thinkers, the power to convince lays not only in overwhelming s displays of opulence or larger than life drama, uh, which was aimed to influence the emotion, but rather um, critical thinking is, is, is more important now. And reason discussion, uh, which persuades the mind, is, is what people are looking for. They are, they're looking for enlightenment through these things. The music of the classical era is going to reflect these principles um, of, of clarity and proportion in what critics of the day calls naturalness. So classical era melodies are going to be, on the whole, more tuneful, less complicated, and more balanced than those of the Baroque era. You will have symmetrical melodic phrasing uh, based on the rhythms of dance music, which extend uh, itself into all genres, both in vocal and classical music. And, and instrumental music. Um, critics of the day are going to praise this homophonic texture for clarity and grace, and you'll see symphonies in this homophonic texture and concertos in homophonic texture, so you can really pay attention to these melodies in ways that you never, you couldn't before. So they're looking for clarity, they're looking for enlightenment. Um, the dense textures of, com of counterpoint become the exception rather than the rule. But this doesn't mean that the music of the classical era is somehow simpler. For uh, a typical movement of music from this period, it features more internal contrast than its Baroque counterpoint. A movement in sonata form, the most important new structural innovation of the classical era, uh, uses multiple themes that differ very much from in, in their melody, in their rhythm, in harmony, and dynamics, and timbre. Um, but it, it 
juxtaposes all of these different things together. So Mozart loves the sonata form, and he uses it in his Symphony No. 40 in G minor, which we will take a look at in, in uh, a few minutes. So this is the classical era. It's really, really exciting. We're going to study some great music from, from this era. If you haven't already done so, I want you to read um, your chapters in the classical era. This is part four in your book. Um, so go ahead and read the introduction for the classical era. And uh, then we're going to also look into the composers of Mozart and Haydn. As I said before, this is the age of enlightenment. So there are some key words that really define this classical era, which are balance, clarity, proportion, and effortlessness. Melodies are going to be less ornate and more tuneful and more balanced. Phrasing is going to be more symmetrical and more rational, like conversation. Your texture is going to be mostly homophonic and there will only be occasional polyphony. This classical era is the age of the natural and it's also the age of the enlightenment. In the enlightenment, as we were talking about just a few slides ago, it's this is an era in which critical thinking and reasoned discussion, progress through dialogue, is most important. It's, it's an era where people are proud that they are free from past superstitions because they can think clearly through different things. The classical ideals are going to bring forth balance and clarity and naturalness. The Enlightenment's going to emphasize reason and science. This is going to be the first music to thrive long after its time, so it will be remembered. Music of this era will also be more tuneful, more balanced, and less complicated. Symmetrical phrasing and homophony are going to dominate this era. Composers of this era have a new challenge for them. They want to create an ideal work of art. They want their, their pieces to appear as if they are effortless genius. This ideal art is going to cover up <clears throat> its mechanical elements. So you're not going to necessarily know how this, this is being created and, and, and everything, how it unravels in front of you, but it's going to uh, be very, it's supposed to be very natural. Artists are going to listen and look to nature as the model for, for music. The goal is to touch the hearts of the listeners in a direct and seemingly spontaneous manner. I like to say that every era is reactionary, where we look back at what was and we try to create something completely new and different than what used to be. This is no different than the Baroque era and the classical era. So the classical composers uh, were trying to do something that was different than had what had been done before. Whereas the Baroque era really prized the idea of ornamentation and spontaneity, uh, now the classical era is looking at balance. The Baroque era was very much into virtuosity, whereas the classical era uh, thought that clarity should be the way to go. The Baroque era was all about expressive extremes, and the classical era is all about naturalness. All of these things are reactionary to what was. In the classical era, music is going to become known as the language of the heart. There's a, a new ensemble that's going to really take hold during this era and gain a lot of traction, and that's the string quartet. So you're going to have works that are for string quartet, which is made up of, usually, two violins, viola and cello. This is an innovation of the classical era, and it's no coincidence that uh, critics of the time talk about Joseph Haydn's string quartet as a rational conversation among four intelligent individuals. These instruments are going to be of equal importance with a voice. Now, remember, this is a new thing. Before that, the voice was going to be more, the voice was more important than the instruments. But here we have a, str a string quartet, which is going to symbolize rational conversation. These melodies that are written during this time are going to use balanced phrases like a rationally structured conversation, and they will have themes. So these parallels between language and music will raise the prestige of music. 
you'll, the string quartet, the symphony and the concerto are going to emerge as preferred genre. And opera will now have plots and characters that are more realistic and uh, real, they'll, they'll display real life situations that people can really identify with. Um, there's a new kind of opera that emerges during this time and that's opera buffa. This is comic opera, something that Mozart is, is very uh, taken with and, and writes a lot for. Historically, the classical era took place during a very exciting time. This was the era of the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution lasted from 1750 to about 1850. Um, the steam engine, the cotton gin, and inter interchangeable parts were all uh, innovations of the Industrial Revolution. There was a sudden shift from agriculture to industry. Suddenly there was a new urban population as everyone moved to the cities and what this did was create more cultural institutions. This was based on urban demand. Theaters and concert halls were put up for the paying public. Composers now had to appeal to wider audiences. The classical era is going to bring with it a discontent with the established social order. This is an era of music and revolution. The plot of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart's comic opera Marriage of Figaro would have been completely unthinkable just a generation before, where Count Almaviva is a nobleman and he's outwitted by his servants. In previous eras, this could have meant that Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart would have lost his head. But uh, what, what it does instead is that this opera is going to capture this growing discontent, this mood of discontent with the established order of society. And these are the decades that are leading up to the French, French Revolution just after the American Revolution. These revolutions encapsulate the Enlightenment ideals. The Declaration of Independence is written. Remember, uh, America is founded in 1776 and the Declaration of Independence takes over. So you have Voltaire and Rousseau and Thomas Jefferson's uh, emphasis on human rights. They're going to be pieces that are written about, um, they're, they're, well, they're going to be written and become anthems for these countries. So the, the piece La Marseille and then also Chester, they're unofficial anthems of France and the United States. Um, Mozart's opera is going to reflect these changing relationships between the, the previous established social order and, and the people and the rights of the people. So um, critics are going to argue, argue for the innate goodness of human beings and for the rational pursuit of human and social betterment. The Declaration of Independence becomes just the quintessential document of the Enlightenment because it's going to recognize the inherent dignity of the individual. Um, and then Thomas Jefferson is going to found this University of, of Virginia on the pre premise that this institution is going to be based upon the illimitable freedom of the human mind. And from here, we're not afraid to follow, our, follow truth wherever it may lead or to tolerate any error so long as we're left free to combat it. So the American Revolution from 1775 to 1781 established the independence of the United States from Great Britain, and the French Revolution in 1789 overthrows the power of what until that, uh, what was held up until that point, it had been the most powerful monarchy in the world. These results not only affected just the countries that were immediately involved, but ultimately every nation in the Western world. National independence and democracy, uh, if not always realized in practice, became the new ideals for the social order. Music is going to help foster these ideals through these national anthems of Marseille and Chester. Um, they'll become the unofficial anthems of the revolutions. Also, we still have this industrial revolution that's still happening underneath all of this. Technology is going to increase economic production. The cities are going to have just 
a, a huge demand for culture and public theory theaters and concert halls will flourish. Haydn and Mozart are going to succeed outside of the church and outside of royal courts. Remember, the church and the royal courts previously were the only ways that a musician could make a living. These guys are going to become the first freelancers. With this idea of revolution, which brings about a more prosperous economy, we have this art of the natural, which is being developed. So artists will look to nature as a model. Composers study is going to allow for more direct I expression. Melodies are becoming less ornate than they used to be in the Baroque era. Textures will lead to lean towards hermophony for clarity. And now you have more realistic opera plots with opera buffa and Mozart. As we look at this classical era, we're going to be covering some new things. No, it's not that we haven't covered them before, it's that they're going to be developed in new ways and redefined in new ways. So some of these things include the genres of music. So this is going to bring forth the string quartet and the symphony and the concerto and opera in ways of clarity and naturalness. We have forms that are, are going to be more clearly defined, and these are sonata form and theme and, and variations. Our two main composers during this era that we will study are Haydn and Mozart. And f throughout the classical era, artists are going to look uh, for to nature as a model, and this is in every single field. So their ideal work of, of art, according to this view, this view, is one that hides its artifice that conceals its mechanical elements and that appears as if it is a product of effortless natural genius. Composers still had to learn technique and study harmony and uh, counterpoint with great diligence so that they can appear as natural geniuses. The goal of this study is not just to show off the art, but it's also to touch the hearts of the listeners in a manner that is direct and seemingly spontaneously. Uh, this new ascetic is going to manifest itself in music in many different ways. Melody <coughs> and ornamentation will be less ornate. Textures on the whole, which in the past were more polyphonic, are going to uh, lean more towards homophony than poly polyphony. And homophony is considered the more natural of the two textures because it allows the ear to focus on just one single melody. Mozart is going to devote himself uh, and, and gr a lot of his energies into this new genre of opera buffa, comic opera, which portrays real-life characters uh, and situations as opposed to these mythological and historical figures of the past that were, were populating Baroque opera up until this point. Um, here in this new form of opera, we will be able to immediately identify with the emotions and the actions of the characters as are presented um, because they're presented in a way that is natural, that, that reflects uh, real life. The first composer that we're going to talk about in the classical era was Joseph Haydn. If you haven't already done so, take a second and read chapter 22 in your book about Joseph Haydn. We will be covering his string quartet in C, um, C major. It's, this is opus 76, number 3, and we're looking at the second movement. The string quartet is often compared to a conversation among four friends. In the second movement of his string quartet, um, each of the instruments, you've got two violins, a cello, and a viola, they're going to present the melody in succession, while the other three voices are going to weave their own commentary in, the, in accompaniment around it. This was composed in 1797. As you read your chapter, make sure that you listen to those listening examples and use the listening guide to help you know and understand what you're listening to. In chapter 22, we are going to be describing the typical sequence of movements of a string quartet in the classical period. We will also listen for the differences among the timbres of the violin, viola, cello within the ensemble of the string quartet. Also, I want to, for us to look and be able to describe on how uh, Haydn is going to treat his texture in the string quartet. Then we will also recognize and, and describe the phrase structure underlying this, this particular movement. 
Next, we will listen for and define the form of theme and variations. We will discuss the ways in which Haydn's professional career is going to shape the genres in which he wrote. And finally, we will discuss the practice of musical appropriation, and hopefully by the end you'll be able to give some examples of this. What you're going to do now is take a second and in your book, listen to this, you're going to listen to this piece, the string quartet in C major, opus 76, number 3 by Haydn, second movement. Use your listening guide so that you know exactly what's going on. And as you listen, I want you to listen to these things. Listen to the timbre. Listen for how the sounds of the four instruments blend together and stand apart. Their sound quality is similar even in different registers. Listen to the texture. Listen to how the melody always appears in one, in one instrument while the other three uh, voices are going to move around it. This uh, texture um, is going to change. So is this texture homophonic or polyphonic? You have to figure that out and decide. Also, listen for passages in which not all of the instruments are playing. In the melody, I want you to listen for pauses that break up the melody into, into sections known as phrases. Some are going to sound like endings. And I also want you to listen for which phrases are repeated. In form, I want you to listen for the way the melody is presented um, with very little changing. Each instrument will have the melody at least at one time, and listen for uh, how little each changes through each instrument across the course of this movement. There's that old saying that a good melody is worth hearing again and again, but at some point we want to hear something different, and we also want to hear a different version of the melody, or a different melody altogether. So during this era, composers are going to use a combination of repetition and variation to contrast and satisfy and sustain our, our interest as listeners. The second movement is a good example of how a melody can offer repetition, but variation and contrast all at the same time. Haydn wrote this a few months earlier for the birthday of the Holy Roman Empire uh, sorry, the Holy Roman Emperor, Franz II, who resided in Vienna. The song is set to the words, God save Franz the Emperor. It was an instant hit and soon became Austria's national anthem. This melody is so closely um, associated with the emperor that Haydn faced a dilemma in writing variations for it. So he decided that he could not alter the melody itself because the ideal emperor is going to be steadfast and not subject to change. So he's going to create a solution for this, which is ingenious. Basically, he's going to repeat the theme more or less unchanged four times in succession, varying only the instrument that plays it and writing contrasting musical lines that will surround the theme from time to time. It, so because he does it this way, the melody will stay fresh because the voices surrounding it are going to be constantly changing. In setting the theme with variations for four instruments of similar timbre, Haydn also imposed an additional challenge on himself. Without a full orchestra at his disposal, he couldn't rely on winds or brass or timpani to create variations of sound. This makes his accomplishment, a movement which sustains interest while repeating a melody four times, even more remarkable. Although Haydn wasn't the first to write for string quartets. He did more than any other composer to establish this new genre's significance in the middle of the 18th century. So um, not in spite of the uh, timbral constraints of, of the genre, but because of them. So Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven uh, will all later take up this challenge to write for string quartet repeatedly throughout their careers. Um, but Haydn was uh, the first. He essentially established this genre of string quartet. It's an intimate genre. It's chamber music. It's not generally for public performances, and it's going to be like a conversation among the players. So you in this movement, you have four movements, and usually they are associated with this term. So you have fast, uh, first movement is fast, the second movement is usually slower, the third movement is going to be moderate in a triple uh, meter, and then the fourth movie movement, which is finale usually, um, that will be faster again. As we said before, this string quartet by Haydn was composed in 1797. The composer sustained the interest with 
repetition and variation and contrast. And this melodic theme was dedicated to the Emperor Franz II. This theme is repeated four times unchangingly. And uh, Haydn contrasts the musical lines to add interest and make it so that you don't fall asleep in the middle of it. Each player has equal importance. No player is more important than the next. And um, string quartets typically have four movements. In front of you is a picture of a string quartet. You will see violin number one. That's the soprano line. Then you have violin number two, who usually plays the alto line. Then you have viola playing tenor and cello playing the bass line. This is usually homogenous in texture. These instruments can blend together to um, so that it's really kind of hard to tell who's who, but they can also emphasize their differences. And each instrument is going to be playing the theme at some point. As far as sound is concerned, as we said before, the violin number one is the soprano voice. The viola and cello are, are larger instruments, and so they will have a deeper um, quality in their sound. The viola is slightly larger than the violin. The cello is much larger than the violin or the viola. So you'll have that, that, those deeper bass voices coming from, from that cello. These four, four voices are going to correspond to the standard ranges in the singing repertoire. And like any good vocal uh, ensemble, these instruments will either blend together and sound like one instrument, or they're going to be um, emphasizing their differences and sounding like four instruments. Haydn expands the variety of this movement by changing the textures throughout. So the theme will first be presented in homophonic fashion. Then the variations will use two-part homophony and four-part polyphony as he is going through the different themes and variations. The melody of this movement is made up of five phrases, and each is going to be marked at the end by a cadence, which is, as we have talked about before, it's a brief resting point. So um, the first two phrases we're going to label as A because they're the same. They're followed by a phrase that's not repeated, and that is phrase B. This is followed by two final phrases, which we'll call C, and they are the same. So neither the A phrase nor the B phrase sounds complete at the end. It's, it's, they're uh, using what is called a half cadence. With each, we expect the music to continue. Not until we get to the end of the C phrase do we feel like that sense of, of conclusion, that final period at the end of the sentence. The structure of these two units, A and B and C, can be compared to the elements that make up a sentence. So the opening phrases like A and B will act as antecedent phrases, ante means before, while C is going to function as a consequent phrase. So that's using the uh, prefix, uh, the yeah, uh, sequent, uh, which is standing for the word following. As in a sentence, you have the antecedent phrase, which will set up the consequent phrase, and the two together will make a complete sentence. This was the basis for many, many melodies, especially during the classical era. Before you continue, make sure that you take a second and listen to the animated notations in your book. So they will demonstrate for you that antecedent phrase a, the, and the antecedent phrase B, and then the consequent phrase C. So this kind of uh, phrase structure with the antecedent and consequent units that together make up a larger whole are called periodic phrase structure. And um, yes, so make sure that you listen to those. So why are we studying this particular string quartet? This is a classical era string quartet form in this particular quartet. So. Um, the movements are going to be very typical of this era. You have four movements and they go slow, sorry, fast, slow, minuet, and then fast finale. The first movement is in sonata form. The second movement is also in sonata form, which is ABA, or, but it also is theme and variations. The minuet is movement three. It's lively, stylized in a dance in triple meter. And movement four, finally, is in sonata form or rondo. It's very fast and light. This melody is periodic phrase structure in movement two. This piece is from the composer who literally founded this genre. And I mean literally, literally. We say literally a lot, but he literally founded this genre. He was the guy who invented string quartet. So you're hearing it from the horse's mouth. 
This is also this uh, theme in variations form. If you notice, the textures change throughout, and you go back and forth between homophonic and polyphonic. This string quartet in C major is in theme and variations form. It's an old form, and it's a simple structure. It's one where you present a theme, and then you vary it at will. The a good melody is worth repeating a lot <laughs> in this case, um, and it was extremely popular in the classical era. So what was Haydn trying to say by that? He was trying to, to represent the character of Emperor Franz II, even, and, and, and say that even though circumstance around, circumstances around the emperor might change, but the emperor himself re, remains steadfast, immovable, unchanged. He also uses instrument, instrumentation and accompaniment to help vary the, the surrounding um, accompaniment to the melody, but the melody itself will stay absolutely the same. Let's take a second and look at uh, Joseph Haydn. So he lived from 1732 to 1809, and it's hard to imagine any individual having their own orchestra at home these days, but that's exactly what he had. Um, and actually that's what Prince Nicholas Esterhazy had in his three different palaces, and uh, Joseph Haydn was in charge of that. This was during the second half of the 18th century, and for almost three decades, Joseph Haydn was the principal director of the prince. So he was the, the music director for Prince Nicholas Esterhazy for three decades, and he wrote music and conducted the court orchestra. The autonomy, autonomy of this forced Haydn to become a, an original. He had to, anything that, that the uh, prince wanted, he had to um, manufacture. Um, but because he was writing music every single day, and this was a pretty steady job, he had to become very, very creative. Haydn wrote that the exactly what the prince would request every single day. He would compose string quartets, operas, sonatas, and symphonies. After the, string, the uh, prince's death, however, um, Haydn left, and he traveled to England in 1790 and Vienna in 1795. So he was the father of two genres, both the string quartet and also the symphony. Haydn once said this about Prince Esterhazy uh, to one of his biographers late in his life. He said, my prince is satisfied with all of my works and I receive the applause. As a director of an orchestra, I can make experiments, observe what I had elicited or weakened in an impression, and thus correct, add, delete, and take risks. I was cut off from the world, and no one in my vicinity could cause me to doubt myself or pester me. And so I had to become an original. So the, in, this, in this context, he wrote whatever was requested of him each day. And if you would like to hear more about Haydn and his works, listen to these pieces. They're on, on the slide in front of you. He's got several string quartets, piano sonatas, also a piece called The Creation, which is quite excellent. In review, this theme and variations form that was so popular during the classical era and worldwide is it's where a theme is presented and then altered in some way. Um, and then composers would often use well-known themes. Haydn kept the theme the same, varying only the voices around the theme. This theme is hymn-like. It resembles four-part homophony. Uh, and then you have variation one by the violin number two. The violin number two has the melody, and violin number one accompanies. And then vi variation two, you have the cello with the melody, and the others are going to accompany. Variation number three, the, uh, Haydn gives the melody to the viola, and only three voices, uh, for the most part, are the variation. Um, and then variation four, four-part polyphony throughout, and this is going to symbolize the melody's dedique, the emperor. Let's talk for a second about musical appropriation. What that is, musical appropriation, is the use or adapt adaptation of a work that currently exists, but using it to serve something other than its original purpose. So Haydn's melody that he wrote was later given new words. One new setting became the German national anthem. And then uh, contrafactum, what that is, a work setting of new words to an established melody. So. Um, you'll find this also true in a lot of hymns uh, that are sung in churches. A lot of them originally were barroom hits. People would sing them in the bars, and because everybody knew what the melodies were already, they would just put new words to them so that 
your average person could sing um, great theology to these very familiar bar songs. Who else do we know that has taken a, a melody or a theme and made it into their own? Well, Aretha Franklin did that with the R-E-S-P-E-C-T song that was uh, put, put out in 1967. Remember that um, this, this melody was originally for the birthday of Emperor Franz II, and um, it was about God save Franz, the emperor, the, and it was the Austrian national anthem. This also became a hymn that praised the people of Hamburg, and it was also uh, written as Germany above all else, which became the German national anthem. Also, it's been used in church music for glorious things of thee are spoken, and praise the Lord ye heavens adore him. This string quartet has been used in many, many different ways. If you want to listen to more music of this classical era, um, including chamber music and solo keyboard music of the classical era, look at these pieces. There's some by uh, Haydn, Mozart, uh, Carl Philipp Bach, not Johann Sebastian Bach. Carl Philipp Bach was the uh, one of the sons of Johann Sebastian Bach. And then also another son of Bach was uh, Johann Christian Bach. These uh, composers of the classical era wrote fantastic works for chamber music and keyboard. You might see this slide a couple of times as you watch these videos. This is just to remind you that if you want to improve your grade, let's say that your midterm isn't going as well study-wise, or I know we haven't taken it yet, but we will in, in uh, by the end of the week. So if your uh, grades aren't going exactly as you want them to, you do have an opportunity for extra credit assignments. Um, you can do up to two um, research papers about any composer that is on your syllabus. So this is a six-page research paper. Um, that's not including, um, well, actually, that is including the bibliography. But the research can include anything uh, that is, is good, solid research. I don't want you to copy this down from Wikipedia. You are not allowed to use AI. If you use AI and I catch you, that's an immediate F and possible expulsion from this class, so don't do that. Um, if you um, use any quotes, direct quotes, you have to directly, um, you have to say that it's a quote, it's not original work, you have to say that it's a quote, and then you also have to document that in your bibliography. These papers are worth 250 points, so a really big chunk of points, so if, if you're afraid that your grade is not going the way you want to, do a paper. It's not, it's actually, once you start writing, you're going to find that there's so much information and it's really easy to write. This can be turned in any time between now and the final exam. You um, need to turn it in online in the Canvas assignment portal. When you think about classical music, probably one of the first names that you think of is Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. We're going to be looking at his Symphony No. 40 in G minor. This is one of three symphonies that he wrote in Vienna in 1788, and it's probably for a concert that he organized himself, although there's no record of the event um, that has survived. So we're going to be looking at the first movement today. It's in sonata form, which is one of the most important structural conventions to emerge from the classical era. Now, if you haven't done this already, take a second, pause this video, and read chapter 25 and listen to the listening examples in your book. Our learning objectives for this chapter are these. So I want you to be able to discuss how the themes of sonata form um, function like characters in a play. Also, I want you to listen for and to describe the basic features of sonata form, including exposition, development, recapitulation, and coda. Listen for and identify the role of modulation to a new key, and also the return to the original key in a sonata form movement. Um, also, describe the ways in which sonata form creates a dramatic musical structure. As you listen, also, Recognize the parts of sonata form in this symphony movement, um, and out, we're going to be outlining Mozart's professional career, and we're going to also discuss his sister, who is a very, very talented musician um, in the 18th century society, and how her career went as well. If we think of musical themes as different characters, we hear all of the essential elements of a good drama in this movement. Um, we're going to have memorable personalities, which are the melodies, 
and there's going to be conflict, which is the juxtaposition and transposition of these melodies. Then, then there will be resolution, the restoration of the melodies in their more or less original form, and these events of the musical drama through are going to be without words. They will unfold in some sort of logical sequence that the same kind of sequence that we would see in a three-act play, where we meet the main character and the supporting characters, and then we witness their interaction and transformation. They're going to fall in and out of love, they'll fight, they'll search for something or, or struggle with something, and then uh, we are going to experience some sort of resolution at the end. It may be happy or unhappy, or it might be something in between, but we're going to recognize it as an ending because all of the strains of the plot will be resolved. So as we listen, I want you to think about how does Mozart present this drama in musical form. He organizes the first movement of the symphony around musical structure known as a sonata form. This, this is a form that was new in the classical era, and it allowed for the presentation, the development, and the resolution of multiple themes within a single movement. Um, this was uh, roughly from 1750 to present day. Composers have literally written thousands of pieces in sonata form. It provided a very versatile framework for presenting drama without words. So as you listen to this, uh, using your listening guide, I want you to think about the form. Listen for the various return of the themes over the course of this movement. Notice the contrast between the character of the themes. Also, for harmony, I want you to listen for the contrast between the heat, the different key areas of the movement. Um, and the opening theme is going to be in the minor mode. And then the next theme is going to be in the major mode. Which mode is going to sound darker? Which is going to sound brighter, minor or major? And then which which mode dominates this entire movement or you know, are both of them given equal time? When you listen to the melody, I want you to think about this. How would you characterize the themes of this movement? Uh, and what makes the themes of this movement different from each other? What exactly is modulation? Well, it's a big word that means going from one key to another key. Think about the Jeopardy theme song, and I've actually included a link to the Jeopardy theme song on uh, your PowerPoint here. So you have and then it modulates, it goes up a step. So the key changes to let the contestants know that they're at the, that 30 second mark and they better write down their answer very quickly if they want to have any chance of winning that prize money. That's modulation, going from one key to a different key. So then we also have another word called tonic. And tonic means it's the main key that a melody is in. There's antecedent and consequent. So antecedent is the first side uh, of a phrase, and then the consequent phrase is the second half of the phrase. We have what are called half cadences and full cadences. Um, and half cadences would be um, where you would have a comma in, se in a sentence. So I'm going to the store and I'm going to pick up some bread and oranges and um, chocolate and cake, you know, because we all need chocolate and cake. Um, but, and then I'm going to the park to have a picnic. So I'm going to the store, comma, that's a half state, a half cadence, and then I'm going to the park to have a picnic. You know, that's the second half. That's the, the end of the sentence. So the half cadence would be like the halfway point, and then the full cadence happens at the end where you would put the period. So um, that's half cadence and full cadence. And if you want a better description, well, definitely look in your book because hover, take your mouse, hover over that, those words, and it will give you the exact definitions. Um, there's going to be a cadenza in this piece, and a cadenza is kind of a place where a virtuosic uh, performer can show off. So they will uh, get very creative, and a lot of, back in this era, a lot of the cadenzas were um, improvised, and a really good performer could improvise a cadenza for um, this this uh, little section of time and show off their skills. Mozart was a master uh, keyboard player, and so he his his cadenzas would be quite elaborate. He also wrote out some cadenzas for people who weren't as creative as he was, um, and so sometimes you'll hear those cadenzas as well. We have different forms in this classical era: binary, rounded binary sonata, and rondo forms. 
<coughs> and this this uh, movement is going to be in sonata form. And um, but pay attention to the forms in your book and make sure that you're um, looking to see what exactly those mean. So like a binary form is like A and then B. Rounded bi binaries where you have the return of A. A, B, A. And A is of course the first melody. Then B would be the second second theme, second melody. And then A returning would be um, very similar to the first melody. Um, we also have what's in sonata form, an exposition, a development, and a recapitulation. And we'll look more at those terms in just a second. And then a coda. Coda is the Italian word for tail. A lot of times uh, composers would, would tack a tail onto the end of their piece to just kind of wrap it up in a, in a really pretty package. Let's now take a closer look at Symphony Number no. 40, Movement 1 by Mozart. Uh, on there, there's a picture on your screen of a very famous film called Amadeus, and it's the story of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. If you would like to get a picture of what this very amazing creative genius was like, I very much recommend Amadeus to you. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful, wonderful film. All right, so this was composed in 1788. Um, there are a lot of different themes, and one of the things that Mozart was accused of was uh, too many ideas, too many themes, but you know, he he was just a genius. He, he had so many ideas, and he would put them into his music, and, uh, and it just made for really great drama. So these different themes make good drama. This musical drama is going to follow a very logical progression. And this sonata form that he's writing in provides a very versatile framework for creating musical drama without words. So we're comparing sonata form to a three-act play. And there's going to be a lot of drama in this three-act play. But act one is going to contain the exposition. And this will introduce us to or expose all of the movement's thematic ideas or the characters. And by the end of the exposition, we will have met all of our musical characters. In Act 2, that is our development. That's the middle part of the sonata form movement in which all of the thematic ideas are most intensively developed. They're developed thematically and harmonically. These themes are taken apart and combined in different ways and tried in different keys. It's kind of an unstable key area as you're, you're going through all of these different keys. Act three is going to be the recapitulation. That's going to come in into the third, uh, last third of this movement. And the themes that we heard in the exposition are going to be recapitulated or recapped. And this provides a resolution to all that we've heard so far. So sonata form comes out of the middle of the 18th century. Um, it's an expansion of a form that's already been established, which was rounded binary form, A, B, A. Uh, and uh, this rounded binary form consisted of two sections, which the opening idea and the tonic key uh, return simultaneously about a third of the way through the movement. And that's where sonata form comes in. So we saw the structure in, uh, we, well, you can see the structure in Haydn Symphony Number no. 102, um, which is a, a chapter that we didn't get to here because we're looking at a different, different piece by Haydn. But um, just trust me, it's there. So, um, yes, you've got the exposition, development, recapitulation, and then there's a broad and flexible scheme throughout that can be manipulated. And, um, yeah, so this is, if you look at this chart, hopefully it, it describes this in a way that's, that's visually um, understandable. Harmony plays a very important role in the sonata form structure, as we've seen. And to sustain a musical argument across a long, a long span of time, Mozart uses different key areas to uh, create variety. And so the modulation in this movement goes from the tonic, which is the first key, um, to the new key area. It's going to be particularly clear because it's going to uh, coincide with a change of mode. So the first key area is G minor, and that, that mood is dark and brooding. And the new key area is going to be B flat major. Here the music is going to sound more brighter and more optimistic um, than it has in the minor moods, the dark and, the dark and brooding moods. Um, so when the themes are presented in this new key, 
and uh, when they return the, in the recapitulation, they're played in G minor again. Um, so you have the first part, which is a minor, then you have the new key in major, and then, then you return when the recap back to that minor mode. So it's as if all of the melodies and all of the characters come home under the spell again of the tonic, the, the key pitch of, of this uh, piece, and thereby you have your resolution and your closure. We're comparing this movement to a three-act play. The dramatic interest of this movement depends not just on the forms and the harmonies, but also on the compelling and contrasting nature of principal melodies. So you're going to have two principal themes here, and they will have maximum contrast. You'll have short notes versus long notes. You'll have active accompaniment versus static accompaniment. You're going to have an agitated mood versus a calm mood. And then both of the themes are going to have that antecedent and consequent phrase structure. And if you have any questions about that, in your book, there's also animated notations. So you can listen to theme one and theme two, and then you can listen to the antecedent and consequent phrases. So if you, uh, if you need to, push pause on this video and go back and listen to those things in your book. Sonata form can be thought of as a drama in three acts. For example, think about the original movie Wizard of Oz. If you've never seen it, this is another excellent, excellent movie that I highly, highly recommend. But at the beginning of this movie, the, the, the opening scenes are in black and white. And it, this, uh, the ending of the movie is also in black and white. And the middle of the movie is in color. So the beginning and the end of the movie function as the exposition and the recapitulation. And then the color scenes in the middle of the movie uh, function as the development. Mozart was a musical prodigy, and we throw that word around a lot, but what exactly does that mean? The actual definition of a prodigy is a person, especially a young one, endowed with exceptional qualities or abilities. When Mozart was four years old, his father walked into uh, the room that he was in, and Mozart was sitting at the piano playing, and and uh, he had a piece of parchment and a pen and um, he and, and ink. And so he was taking the pen and dipping it all the way down into the inkwell and then writing with it. And of course, I mean, he hadn't had a whole lot of practice writing, and so there were these big ink splotches all over the music. And uh, But he his father came in. He's like, what are you doing? And Mozart said, I'm writing a concerto. And his father said, let me see it. And so he looks at this piece of music that his four-year-old has written, and it has um, very clear themes and very clear expositions and developments and everything. And, and this, this little four-year-old, you know, he's, he's, his hand is covered in ink. You know, there's, there's ink on the, on the keyboard. And, and his father sits down at the keyboard and he starts playing. And, and tears come to his eyes as he realizes just how gifted his son is. Now his son has been growing up in the, in the palace with his father who was a, um, worked as a uh, court musician. But he, his son has been listening to all of this music and his son um, has had all of these ideas and these melodies floating in his head. And he decided he was going to write his own concerto. And as tears came to his dad's eyes, he said, this is wonderful. The only difficulty is that it's so complex that no one will ever be able to, to play this. Well, that didn't slow him down. Mozart continued to write many, many melodies as a child and even as he grew up. He wrote his first opera when he was just 11. We'll get more into that in, in a minute. But that is a musical prodigy, prodigy, someone who has genius at a very young age and is able to um, to develop it and, and grow as, you know, whatever whatever they end up being. Chess prodigy, math prodigy, music prodigy. We hear a lot about those, those sorts. And, and Mozart was a music prodigy. Let's look at his life just a little bit. Mozart was born in 1756, and he lived until 1791. It's not a very long life. Um, his father was Leopold Mozart, and he wrote the book on Baroque violin, and this book on Baroque violin is still used today. He was a child prodigy. Uh, Wolfgang performed on extended concert tours throughout Europe, and he met composers and performed and learned about styles of composition and performance, of course, as he's traveling, as he's getting to know different people and playing for different people. Like many prodigies, think about child stars in uh, 
in, in our current world, but he had difficulty transitioning into adulthood. He moved to Vienna in 1781, um, probably with the idea of, hey, Haydn is in Vienna and he has a court, uh, a court job. You know, he's, he's working for Prince Esterhazy. Um, and so Mozart moved to Vienna in 1781, looking to get possibly a court position, but he failed to get a court appointment and was without steady employment. So he was sort of a freelancer. He supported um, his family through public piano performances um, and sheet music and, and sales and, and teaching. Um, so yes, and he was a freelance musician. He died at the age of 35, just as his popularity was beginning to take off. Now we have two other pieces that we're going to cover of Mozart's in this classical era, but let's just say that you can't get enough of Mozart. And you know that listening to classical music while you're studying uh, improves the brain activity. So if you want to listen to more Mozart, look up these pieces. Uh, they're here in front of you. Travel back in, in these days was much, much different. You would travel by horse and carriage. Of course, there's no um, trains or anything like that to get around or even cars. Um, but so, so when these composers would travel to faraway places, it was a big deal. Mozart was all over Europe. So before he turned 18, Mozart had traveled to many cities in Europe with his father, Leopold. He was in Paris three different times. He was in England once. He was in Italy three different times, Prague, four trips. And then he went to Berlin once as well. But, uh, you know, his, his native, um, country was Austria in, in the Vienna region. Now we hear about and we know a lot about Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, but another person that we don't hear too much about is his older sister, Maria Anna Mozart. She was called Neneri. She matched her brother's skill on the keyboard and when they would tour together, and they did often in the early years, she would, she would get the top billing. As they grew older, eventually she stopped performing and touring. And this is um, also indicative of that female composers had fewer professional outlets, but she was a gifted composer, a really gifted uh, keyboardist. And um, they, yeah, they grew up performing together. I call this next slide music to study by. So if you want some good study music, here you go. Here are some other symphonies that you should look up by Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. Just go on YouTube and... Um, you know, type in, type in these symphony numbers by Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart and um, listen to them while you're studying. It'll, it's, it's good background music. You know, I'm going to say this. If you haven't already read chapter 26, please pause this video and do so. So this is going to be a chapter still, yes, still on Mozart, but about his piano concertos. We're going to be looking specifically at piano concerto in A major. This was written in 1786. And in this, this piano concerto, Mo Mozart explores a variety of moods across three movements from the serene but passionate first movement to the dark, contemplative second movement all the way to the rousing exuberant finale. Here we're just going to be listening to the first movement alone. Make sure that you listen to the listening guide and use the listening guide and also the uh, different listening excerpts as well. In this chapter, we want to look at why Mozart wrote piano concertos. We also want to look for the different timbral relationships between the soloist and the orchestra in a concerto. We want to be able to describe Mozart's use of melody in this piano concerto and listen um, for the inter integration of sonata form and the Ritornello principle in this solo in this first movement as well. Remember uh, Ritornello principles where you have orchestra, soloist, orchestra, soloist. Um, and also we want to uh, listen for the cadenza in this movement and describe its nature. Finally, we will describe the relationship between the sonata form and double exposition concerto form in this piano concerto. And also we're going to look at a piano itself and uh, describe the type of piano that was used in these performances uh, back in Mozart's time. When Mozart moved to Vienna in 1781, he was determined to make an impression on the imperial court and the public, both as a pianist and a composer. So his piano concertos provided him with an ideal vehicle for accomplishing both of these tasks. Audiences marveled at his uh, virtuosity and, and skill on the keyboard, um, and also as his ingenuity as a composer. 
Over a span of less than 10 years, Mozart composed 17 concertos for piano, including this one. Now, look like so many of others, other works by Mozart, um, this is going to seem effortless and natural and very clear and unforced, which, as you recall, that was the goal of the classical era. So these concertos in the classical era are going to combine the Ritonello principle from the Baroque era with this newer sonata form. Now, it, this, this is going to seem effortless and natural and clear and unforced, but it's not simple. <laughs> in fact, um, some of Mozart's critics um, said of him that the sheer variety and number of musical ideas were just overwhelming and that his, his pieces contained too many notes. For a time, Mozart's Vienna Gamble paid off. His concert series in the years from 1783 to 1786 were a great success and attracted a great number of subscribers, including wealthy aristocrats whose opinions could make or break the career of any new musician that had just arrived in Vienna. Mozart kept his expenses down by doing practically everything himself. He wrote the music for the concerts. He would hire the musicians. He would perform the music himself as a soloist and as a conductor. Sometimes he would be both soloist and conductor in the same concert. Um, he uh, would even sell the tickets out of his own apartment. Um, we have copies of his early balance sheets that that says they say, they say that he made a pretty good profit on some of these concerts. And to give a sense of you know what how much money he would make, well, his rent was about four hundred and sixty gulden per year, and um, the subscription series of six concerts would generate more than three times of his annual household costs. So there's a, a copy of uh, some of his, his spreadsheets in your, in your book. Take a look at those. It's, they're very interesting. Okay, as we listen to this piano concerto, this is what you're listening for. Listen for the timbre. Listen to the relationship between the solo instrument, the piano, and the orchestra. Sometimes they're going to cooperate, and sometimes they're going to oppose each other. Sometimes they'll appear... A, alone and sometimes they'll be together so listen for those things also the melody listen for the number and the variety of melodies each of them will have its own distinct character listen how how these melodies rarely appear in the same guise twice listen for the form listen for the solo's interest entrance and then later listen for the return of the opening. It's about two-thirds of the way through the movement, and that's called, remember, the recapitulation. As we delve just a little bit deeper into this piano concerto, look at the characteristics of the four main themes. So the first theme is serene and balanced. It has a homophonic texture. Remember, that's the, the melody accompanied by the orchestra or accompaniment of some sort. There are going to be soft dynamics. It's a mixture of conjunct and disjunct motion. And the uh, main theme is going to have a downward contour. The second theme is going to be more agitated. It is also homophonic. The dynamics are loud. Suddenly you have upward leaps and upward contour. The third uh, theme is going to have short note values. It will be homophonic as well but the dynamics will be soft, and then it will have conjunct motion um, and downward contour. And the fourth theme is going to be calm, and you'll have longer note values, softer dynamics, then you'll have downward and then upward leaps. These are the characteristics of the four themes that are in this movement. Let's pick apart the themes. The themes are a drama of contrast. So Mozart uses every possible combination of soloist and orchestra. At the beginning, it's orchestra alone. When the piano first enters, it's soloist alone. And then the sol the orchestra comes in to support the soloist. Then you have later the soloist supporting the orchestra. And then at the end, you have both the soloist and the orchestra on equal footing. Mozart typically used many more melodies than his contemporaries. In fact, he was accused of having too many ideas and using too many notes. Dynamics and texture and rhythm also contribute to the variety and the contrast of his melodies. This movement uses four main themes, and each theme has a very different shape and a very different feel.
The movement of this theme is double exposition concerto form. It is a modified sonata form. So there will be two expositions. There will be one for orchestra and tonic, and then one for the soloist and the orchestra. And when that one comes in, it will modulate to a new key area. Also, there's a cadenza. This is an elaborate improvisation on themes that we hear earlier in the movement for the soloist alone. And then finally, after the cadenza, there will be a recapitulation and the coda. As the concerts were moving to public opera houses and public concert halls, these public concerts allowed Mozart to support himself. Mozart performed his own symphonies and concertos um, at his own subscription series. He ran this series almost entirely by himself, and he, it was a very successful venture for a while. Mozart is a good example of a, what would be considered a successful freelancer in Vienna during this time, and he kept his expenses bound, down by doing almost everything himself. I was talking to you earlier about some of the spreadsheets that still exist, um, that uh, are copies of his budgets and everything. So this is this is one of those those budgets. So this shows you how much he paid for his orchestra musicians, the concert hall, the lighting, um, and how much things cost. So when he would uh, he would conduct and perform so you didn't have to pay a conductor or a performer he would do that himself he composed the music himself um, and sometimes he would be conducting and while he was playing piano and, and bringing the orchestra in as well but um, so yeah take a take a look at what his profit margins were of course we know that Mozart wasn't the only classical composer to write piano concertos here are several other successful uh, musicians during this time that wrote piano concertos if you haven't already done so, take a second and read chapter 27. Yes, we're still on Mozart, but now we're going to discuss one of his very famous operas called The Marriage of Figaro. We're going to be looking at a piece in this opera called Cosa Sento. So this was composed in 1786, and like his other works, this has dramatic contrasts and modulations and sudden changes that are very characteristic of instrumental music in the classical era. Um, this provides composers with a means by which to enhance the drama um, on the stage. So in this chapter, this has an excerpt from the opera, from Mozart's opera, Marriage of Figaro, and the music is going to give added depth to the words and the actions and of the characters on stage. Our learning objectives for this chapter are as follows. First, you're going to summarize the plot of Marriage of Figaro. Then I want you to listen to the contrasting dramatic qualities of the voices and the melodic styles of these three characters. Next, identify the contrasting melodies associated with each character. You will listen for the recurring themes as they're related to the text that's being sung, and you'll listen for the passage of accompanied, re accompanied recitative with this excerpt. Say that three times quickly. Accompanied recitative. You sound very smart. Mozart wrote his very first opera when he was just 11 years old. This opera was called Apollo Eosynthius, and it's in Latin. You might not think that the material is very promising. However, Apollo is astonishing. It contains music of great beauty and dramatic insight. In the classical era, opera is big business, and it remains prestigious and lucrative. So there's this new kind of opera that Mozart was was experimenting with and it's called opera buffa buffa is from the italian word uh which is the root for buffoon this is comic opera it uses the same conventions recitative aria chorus etc but it's different from serious opera in that it did uh, the the previous operas would often revolve around mythical or historical figures in their plots. So this instead, this classical opera, classical era opera, is going to deal with believable characters that are very relatable. The opera Marriage of Figaro was based on a play by French dramatist Pierre Augustin Caron de Marchais. Now this plot would have been unthinkable in previous generations, and we'll discuss why in a second. Um, it was, there was a librettist for this opera, and his name was Lorenzo de Pont, and it was sung in Italian. In the trio from Mozart's opera, The Marriage of Figaro, 
Um, the words and the music are going to combine to create moments of intense confrontation full of both suspense and humor. The text enriches the music and the music enriches the text. The scene that occurs towards the end of the opera's first act is the one that we're going to be listening to here. There are three characters uh, singing in this section and this is what you this is who they are. So you have uh, Count Almaviva, the, who's the bass. He's married the countess but he has his eyes on somebody else, Susanna. Susanna is the Countess's maidservant. She's engaged to be married to Figaro, who is the Count's manservant. Then you have Basilio, who's the music teacher of the court. He's meddlesome, and he loves to gossip. The final character who doesn't sing in this um, trio is Cherubino, and this is a page boy. And I want you to click on the link and watch this this little clip of opera because it's worth hearing the opera, but it's also worth seeing the opera. It's a, it's a stage stage play with music throughout the entire thing. So what exactly is going on in the scene? Well, we have the character Cherubino who uh, doesn't sing here, but in the previous scene, um, we, we have some action with him. And so Cherubino is infatuated with women in general and the Countess in particular. In one scene just prior to this one, uh, Cherubino has been asking for Susanna's help in calming the anger of the Count, who the day before caught him making advances on Barbarina, who is the young daughter of the gardener. But while Cherubino and Susanna are discussing this matter in the Countess's chamber, the Count arrives unexpectedly, and Cherubino must hide behind a large chair. The audience, of course, can see everyone who's on stage. This is part of all of the humor of the scene. In the process of trying to seduce Susanna, remember the Count is in love with Susanna, um, the Count is in turn interrupted by the impending arrival of the music teacher, Basilio. So now the Count must hide, and he goes to hide himself behind the very large chair where Cherubino is, but using her quick wits, Susanna steps between the Count and the chair and directs Cherubino to hide himself under one of the large dresses of the Countess that just happens to be lying there. So just as a Count assum assumes his position behind the chair, Basilio enters the room. He's meddlesome, and he teases Susanna about the Count's interest in her. He then goes on to tell her about Cherubino's interest in the Countess, which by now has become common knowledge at the court. At this moment, an indignant Count bursts from his hiding place and he yells, I heard that! Cosa sento! And with that, the scene begins. So this is comic opera, opera, opera buffa, and Mozart uses opera buffa. Um, quite often, he, he likes this, this medium of opera. Buffa uses the same root word as buffoon. So this genre is going to use many of the same conventions as serious opera, Opera, you have arias, recitatives, and ensembles and choruses, but the plots are not mythical or historical, um, like the previous era. So instead, they'll de they'll deal with very believable characters, and we will be able to relate to all of the characters to some degree. The next thing that we want to listen to as we're we're processing all of this scene is we want to listen to. Uh, the word music relationships. Listen for the contrasting styles of Susanna, the opera, and Basilio, the tenor, and the Count, who's the bass. These three personalities are shaped by the words and also by the way each character sings them. Listen to the form. Listen to the varying musical tension throughout the scene. These three characters sing not just to each other, but also to the audience. Um, then in the melody, you're going to be listening for the return of the opening melody at various points in the middle. Uh, notice the sudden change in style from the Count from lyrical to declamatory as the action unfolds. Even without the libretto, this is a highly dramatic scene. The witty libretto, which is the text of an opera, it, it's by Lorenzo de Pont, and he's an Italian poet, but it's also based on a stage play, which is by the French dramatist Pierre-Augustin Caron de, de Beaumarchais. And um, so a, a lot is going to happen here within this short amount of time. So as soon as the Count emerges from his hiding, hiding place, Cosa Santo, I heard that, he exclaims. Basilio backtracks and he apologizes. He claims that what he had been saying about Cherubino and the Countess was in fact 
merely a suspicion rather than fact. But the Count is all the more determined now to banish Cherubino from the court. He tells Susanna and Basilio about his counter with the page the day before, and he describes exactly how he discovers Cherubino under the table by lifting up the tablecloth. And while he's doing this, he's illustrating his discovery of the previous day by lifting the dress off of the chair, only to find Cherubino cringing before him and hiding yet again. So the duplicity and irony of all of all of this is hilarious because the Count himself had just been hiding behind this very chair moments before. The Count has had come to seduce Susanna on the day of her wedding, and yet when he overheard Basilio talking about Cherubino's infatuation with the Countess, he becomes outraged. And just what was the Count doing there at Barbarina's house the day before when he discovered Cherubino there? She was more flustered than usual, the Count observes. Clearly, this was not the first time that the Count had visited Barbarino. So this scene is going to illustrate Mozart's uncanny ability to, co- to capture the essence of these individual characters and at the same time move the plot forward through music. What Mozart, what his, his music portrays here is so convincingly uh, in this brief trio is the fluidity of each character's emotions and we're going to witness some some great emotion here. This was composed in 1786. You have words and music that combine to create this suspenseful and humorous scene. This is comic opera, opera buffa, built on some of the same conventions that serious opera was built on um, just years before. The word music relationships here will be expressed by the character of each voice. This brilliant dramatic libretto by the poem is filled with witty and action-packed moments and the music that Mozart writes it encapsulates the uh, individual characters and it's going to advance the plot. The fluidity of each character's emotion is especially noteworthy. You will see the Count and you'll hear the Count move from outrage on hearing Basilio's suspicions about Cherubino to astonishment when he discovers discovers Cherubino in hiding once again for the second time in two days. And then you'll also hear Basilio moving from embarrassment when he realizes that the, that the Count has overheard his uh, gossip about the Countess to triumph when Cherubino's presence uh, in the Countess's chamber bears out. And then Basilio says, uh, this is only, these were only mere suspicions. You will hear uh, Susanna moving through states of increasing humiliation that her reputation has been tarnished or compromised by the presence of three male visitors in her room and none of them should be in her room they shouldn't be where they are and certainly not with her when she's alone on her wedding day so you have all of these contrasting and evolving emotional states that are reflected in the melodies that mozart gives to each character mozart writes distinctly different melodies for each of the emotional states of his three characters. Um, You are going to have uh, the Count's opening theme, theme one in the listening guide, which is later in the chapter, is going to be slow and rising, and it will reflect his determination to banish Cherubino from the court. And then you have Basilio's winding and slightly hesitant descending line, which is theme two. That matches his embarrassment at having overheard repeating Um, malicious gossip about the Countess. Uh, Then you have theme three, which is Susanna's shaking, agitated melody. It sounds like it's shaking. It it bounces back and forth with a very narrow register, reflecting her personal agitation. And at this point, she alone knows that Cherubino, who is the object of all the gossip, is hiding in the room. Later, the Count is going to tell about his encounter with Cherubino the day before he suddenly shifts to a more syllabic, declamatory style of singing, and this is the accompanied recitative, which is a, uh, accompanied by the, the orchestra. Um, it's going to be a more standard recitative accompaniment of basso continue alone, and this passage is going to stand in marked contrast to the rest of the scene, because it's the narrative for something that's already happened in the past. As in any opera, you have form built around the text. You have recurring musical themes, that reflect the dramatic themes. The dramatic interruptions provide contrast in in all of these themes. And then there are there's alteration of a recurring idea with contrasting sections which are going to be similar to a rondo. 
if you have not had enough Mozart yet, well, let's expand your playlist. Here are some other Mozart operas that you can look at. Um, and then also some operas by Gluck, who is another operatic composer in the classical era. Some things that you should probably know as we wrap up our chapter on Mozart is that um, he didn't live very long. He was only 35 when he died. He had a lifetime of illness. And um, he had this mysterious commission of Requiem. A, a Requiem is a piece that you write about death. And um, it was unfinished at his death. It was finished by uh, a student of his afterwards. Um, but there's some posthumous specu speculation about what happened after his death. And there are two links there. If you want to get into that and read that, it's, it's a little bit interesting. Um, about the uh, the finishing of the Requiem and, and about his death. I mean, there's all kinds of conspiracy theories here. The next several slides are a classical summary. So it, it will help you make connections and compare the music of the Baroque and the classical era. So take some time, review these slides. And there, of course, these slides are really fantastic for um, quick review when you're when you're doing midterms or finals or that sort of thing. So remember, these slides are at the end of every PowerPoint.